Thank you so much, Stacy. Friends, our scripture for today is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Let us hear these words from the Apostle Paul. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Thanks sister. Thanks be to Good God. Good morning to you. Am I late? Yes, yes I, I'm so sorry. Oh, oh excuse me. Oh, my goodness. Me. <laughs> Friends, look who we have here. Oh. Could it be? Good Could morning. it be? Good morning, sister. Good morning, Reverend brother. Thomas Cuthbert? Yes, dear sister. From 1871? <laughs> Is there any other? Perhaps not. <laughs> good morning to you, brother. <laughs> good morning, good morning. <laughs> good morning, Sister Constance. There, I see you there. <laughs> brother Hiram. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Sister Sarah. <clears throat> good morning to you. <clears throat> good morning. Welcome. Well, good morning to all of you, sisters. And brothers, uh, I am so very honored <clears throat> and honestly quite relieved that God's providence has brought me safely to this place <laughs> this time and uh, <clears throat> to you. I, uh, it has uh, certainly been an arduous journey, <clears throat> one full of perils, but uh, certainly uh, ordained and blessed by God. <clears throat> well, now, uh, before we begin our meeting in earnest, <clears throat> I should like to relate to you how I, Reverend Thomas Cuthbert of Yorkshire, England, appointed to be a circuit rider by the Northern Iowa annual Methodist conference came to be standing here before you as your pastor. <clears throat> Previously, I had immigrated from England and made my way here to the Sioux River Valley, Dakota Territory in 1869. I then staked a claim over there on the east side of the Sioux River where there I made for myself a sod dugout for my shelter, and upon this appointment, I set out to find for us a location for our meetings. <clears throat> Being able to ford the Sioux River on my pony jack, <laughs> one particularly pleasant day, I, uh, I found my way to the home of Dr. and Mrs. Josiah Phillips, and I greeted Mrs. Phillips through her back screen door with a howdy, <laughs> which did indeed startle her. <clears throat> but she replied with a howdy and did indeed invite me into her kitchen. I asked if perhaps uh, our new Methodist class uh, could uh, meet for our religious services in their living rooms on the Saturday and Sunday of every weekend. And uh, Mrs. Phillips replied that her husband would find us other places in town. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I said, I said, I want to meet here. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Phillips shortly thereafter arrived home and granted us permission for our members to meet in their lovely carpeted homes. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this lasted for a few weekends <clears throat> until uh, Mrs. Phillips grew weary of having to clean her carpets on her hands and knees every Monday. Evidently, I was ejecting tobacco juice rather uh, indiscriminately upon their carpets. <clears throat> thus, thus we find ourselves this morning meeting in the old barracks of this abandoned Fort Dakota. Well now, let us begin 
Our meeting with prayer, originally written by our founder, the Reverend John Wesley. <clears throat> oh, merciful Father, do not consider what we have done against you, but what our blessed Savior has done for us. Don't consider what we have made of ourselves, but what he is making of us for you, our God. Oh, that Christ may be wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption to every one of our souls. May his precious blood cleanse us from all our sins and your Holy Spirit renew and sanctify our souls. May he crucify our flesh with its passion and lusts and cleanse all our brothers and sisters in Christ across the earth. And may I hear an amen. amen. <clears throat> I greet you. In the glorious, holy, and almighty name of our living God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I ask you, how is it with your soul? Sisters, don't feign surprise. Brothers, don't look left and to the right as though I'm speaking to someone else and not addressing you. You have proclaimed, you have vowed that you desire to flee the wrath that is to come when you joined this class for growth and accountability and seriously and without hesitation do the work of Christ in this time and place. Did you honestly think that an accounting would not be required of you here on earth? Did you consider that the first time you would need to defend your life would be at the eternal judgment? If so, woe be unto you. I ask you again, how is it with your soul? And, and more so, do you desire Christ? In Christ alone. Do you shun the temptation and deny the wiles of the evil one? Do you diligently search the Holy Scriptures for inspiration and correctiveness in your life and the life of your family? Have you been diligent and faithful in prayer? Have you been constantly on your knees beseeching the throne of Christ for others and for yourself? Has your speech been simply yes or no without any sinful embellishments? Have you been scrupulously fair in your business transactions? Have you been true in your marriage and perfect in your guidance of children and those new to faith? Are you going on to perfection in love of God and neighbor? Let us begin with you, Sister Constance. Sister Constance, rise and make an accounting for yourself. Sister, how is it with your soul? <clears throat> Reverend Cuthbert, my soul sorrows for this land and it grieves for this wayward people. I am in prayer daily, and I am on my knees constantly that Christ will send conviction and correction upon my lazy husband, my stubborn family, and the people of this rustic backwater place. I pray that all may be convicted of their obvious sinfulness, be brought to a true conviction of their need for atonement, and be brought to true Sister humanity. Constance, Sister Constance, you did not answer my question. I asked, how is it with your soul? Oh, sister, you are full of pride. Yes. You have dared to stand before these faithful members and have admitted that you have judged and judged harshly the souls of others. You have 
You have not spared one drop of mercy for their humanity. Have you spent all of God's mercy on yourself to save your vanity? Oh, sister, do you truly, I mean truly, desire Christ and Christ's love for others as well as you demand mercy for yourself? Recall the prayer of the Lord. Do you understand that God forgives us as we forgive others? Do you? Do you? If so, go sit down. <laughs> sit down in prayer and do not return without having made a full account of your sins and need for Christ's saving mercy. <clears throat> brother, Brother Hiram, how is it with your soul? <clears throat> uh, well, Reverend Cuthbert, I reckon that my soul is a humble and grateful one. I acknowledge that my only hope for eternal salvation is through Jesus Christ. I pray every morning to God for his help in my, in my providence of the day and every night for forgiveness for my many transgressions against him and my neighbors and what I must have done. I read every day the, the scripture and the good book for, for teachings and I don't study as often as I should, but I reckon I study as often as I can and still provide for my family. Reverend Cuthbert, I may not be a perfect vessel, but I am God's vessel. Brother, do you believe you are going on to perfection? I reckon that with God's help, I am. Well, Brother Hiram, please be seated. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, regard your humble servant, Hiram, and continue to bless his life with fruits of the Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> and now, brothers and sisters, as this morning draws to an end, permit me a few moments to share with you some heartfelt words of encouragement and promise. <clears throat> During the last couple of days, my heart has been made most tender for this place and for you, God's people who live in the area of the Sioux River Valley. I have come to believe that you are mostly men and women of faith and true hearts for the gospel and for the work of Christ among the poor, the lost, the lonely, the ill, the needy, and the dying. I see evidence of this all around me. Although this place for gathering and worship, this barracks of Fort Dakota may appear humble now, I have been given a glorious vision. A vision that this place has a destiny to be much, much more. A bright, strong legacy for the future. I have been given by God a vision of increasing strength in witness and proclamation to all needy people and a growing ministry devoid of judgment and pity. This vision showed me that others will come after I am gone, and it may be soon, for not many ministries of circuit riders last for more than oh, one to two years. <clears throat> it is not by accident that we sing and are we yet alive a hymn by Charles Wesley at our yearly conferences. Oh, the beautiful words of that old hymn, the words that speak. And are we yet alive and see each other's face? Glory and thanks to Jesus give for his almighty grace. Preserved by power divine to full salvation here. Again in Jesus' praise we join and in his sight appear. What troubles have we seen? What mighty conflict past, fighting without and fears within since we assembled last. When we say goodbye at the end of the conference, we wonder 
if those that we love and those with whom we serve will still be alive when we gather again at our conference the following year. We understand the danger. We fear the perils of the circuit. We hope for their safety. We pray for the best of them, those children of God, those children of God whom they meet and serve and for their ministries. I remember when I said a tearful farewell to my brother in Christ, circuit rider and believer, Thomas Jefferson Moeller. And I wondered whether I would ever see him again in this life. Brother Moeller is one of the best preachers I have ever heard and has such a heart for Christ. He has been sent to a new circuit down there in uh, uh, northern Nebraska and uh, uh, southern Dakota, which is always a challenge. <clears throat> Oh, it would be so wondrous if the bishop would send to you a person like Thomas Jefferson Moeller, a spirit-filled leader, a passionate person who has been lifted by God for ministry in this place and for the sacred times they live. My friends, in my vision, I saw that each preacher sent here will in their time faithfully guide, lead, teach, and nurture. They will bring their own unique portion of God's vision into this place. They will baptize and confirm your children. They will teach your children and those new to faith to love the Lord and that the Lord loves them. They will visit those sick and disabled and comfort the sorrowing and grieving. They will marry and bury your loved ones. They will study earnestly and prayerfully the Bible, the Word of God. They will stand in the breach between this world and heaven. They will bring a word of comfort to those afflicted, and dare I say they will bring a word of affliction to those comfortable. They will bring the blessed meal of the Lord, the sacrament of holy communion by which we join in the everlasting commu uh, communion of the saints. <clears throat> and hear this well. I believe I have seen what God has planned for this community of believers. This community of believers will nurture leaders, many leaders who will serve the Lord here in Sioux Falls and as circuit riders, teachers, and preachers in the mission field. Oh, yes, sisters and brothers, the field is white with the harvest and the laborers are few. And yes, I'm looking at you, Brother Hiram. <laughs> Pray on this, brother, as I'm praying for you. These leaders will bring their God-given talents to bear upon the challenges of poverty, exclusion, ignorance, hatred, fear, and disunity. These people will not rely upon their own abilities, nor will they say they are unable. These people, these people will put their trust in God and know that God does not call the able. God enables those God calls. And loudly and clearly, my vision revealed the work that day to day work of the ministry of Christ and the proclamation of the gospel is a mutual ministry that rests with the circuit riders, the clergy, and with you. Yes, you, you together will be the strength, the witness, and the example and the power of the Methodist movement. You together will be the source 
of increasing compassion among the lost, the loaned, and the last. Your lives, 10, 20, 50, 100, 150 years into the future. And now, hear this, my friends, this reading from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, 21, as our concluding prayer. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. And let me hear an Amen. Amen. And now, sisters and brothers, I bid you a heartfelt thank you for your presence. My pony Jack and I are now off to Canton for an evening class until we meet again. a guest from 1871 to be with us today. So we wanted to thank Tom Roberts for his, his presence with us as he shares the story of our founding pastor, Reverend Thomas Cuthbert. And also, as he mentioned, one of Reverend Cuthbert's contemporary, actually my great, great,